Okay. A couple things before we actually look at the saddles themselves for the fitting. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look at some things with the, the muscle structure and some of the stuff with the horse. Um, where the horse sh is going to be carrying our weight is going to be through here. Um, Western saddles and English saddles and Baroque saddles, they don't all fit the same. So where we want that saddle and how it sits might be a little different. We'll get into that in a minute. But what I don't want is I don't want anything pushing any in any one isolated area because that's going to create back pain. Now one of the things that's interesting when we start looking at horses and again over hundreds and hundreds of horses, where do they usually get sore? It's either up through here or back through here, mm -hmm. which is exactly the opposite of where we should be carrying the weight, which is through here. Um, so a couple of big problems we have are saddles that are too narrow or too long mm -hmm. and too flat. Um, but one of the things I want to take a look at as we're, we're looking at how this horse carries our weight, historically, most of the saddles that we study, whether it's from the 1400s, the 1914 or today, they carried about 16 to 18 inches of weight bearing surface. Mm. So if you think about the carrying surface of like a really good dressage saddle, really good Baroque mm. saddle, um, a lot of your, your Australian stock saddles, you look at the amount of weight bearing surface, historically 16 to 18 inches. When we study the cavalry, US mm. cavalry, British cavalry, Australian cavalry, all from the 1800s, their saddles were, the trees were about 21 inches with about 16 to 18 inches of weight bearing surface. And they generally carried total about 300 pounds, 150 kilo mm -hmm. of weight. The rider, his rifle, his ammo, his water, his food, his saddle, all his gear, it was about that much weight. In fact, in the US cavalry, if you weighed more than 150 pounds, you couldn't be a cavalryman, you were too big. Right. Um, so when we're looking at this, we just kinda wanna keep this in perspective. I've studied a lot of the old California saddles from the 1800s and early 1900s, and the vast majority of them have about a 21 inch bar mm -hmm. in the tree and about 16 to 18 inches of weight bearing surface. So that's something I wanna keep in mind when we're looking at this. Now there's a couple of things that for me with my saddles I need to have. I want that good weight bearing surface so I can ride this horse all day, 12 hours, because mm -hmm. on the ranch when you leave in the morning you never know how long you're, you're gonna be. Um, so if I ride him 12 hours I should be able to give him one day off and the following day come back and have his back totally fine. Now the next day, is it going to be a little muscle sore? It's like, well, if I ride for 12 hours, I'm going to be a muscle, little muscle sore. Mm -hmm. But he should be the following day ready to go. The other thing I need is I need this horse to be able to bend. So when I look at this, I want this horse to be able to bend through his body. When I put weight on one side, so if I put weight on the left seat, mm -hmm. what's going to happen? These muscles are going to contract and he's mm -hmm. going to bend through his body. I need to make sure that the saddle does not interfere with that. The other thing I need to be able to do is, I, for me personally, I need to be able to rope. And if I'm going to rope, that means that I have to have a saddle that does not dig in behind the shoulder and does not dig into the loin. So these are my personal requirements. So because of that, um, I need a saddle that, that really is very specific. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the modern Western saddles just don't fit that. They're too long, too flat, yeah. um, and they, we lose one of those three. Um, or two or, of those three, okay? So when we start looking at our saddles, mm -hmm. at first glance, these three saddles look pretty similar um, at first glance. But when we take a really close look at them, or even, you know, just kind of step back and look twice, we find that they're actually quite different in many ways. Um, but one of the things to keep in mind that no matter who makes the saddle, the important part is the tree that is under this leather. If all three of these saddles were made on the same tree, and if they all had the same rigging position and the same seat, or the same uh, stirrup position, as far as the horse is concerned, it's pretty much the same saddle, mm -hmm. um, as far as how it feels. If these two have the same tree, and this one has a different tree, it's gonna be a whole different ball game. And one of the things a lot of people don't realize, and it's kind of one of those dirty little secrets of the saddle making business, is that the vast majority of saddle makers use the same trees. There's only a handful of suppliers that supply the trees, and most saddle makers 
probably a good 90 plus percent um, don't even make their own trees because mm -hmm. tree making is a whole nother skill set. It's a totally different skill set than saddle making. So the guy that made this saddle, he bought his tree. Yep. The guy that made this saddle. Made his tree. He made his tree. Yep. The guy that made this saddle, definitely, I know, I know for mm -hmm. sure he made yeah. his tree too. So this saddle, because it was a purchased tree, there are probably a whole lot of saddles made by different people, but for the horse, they feel the same as this because it's got the same tree, same rigging, and same stirrup position. Mm -hmm. And the stirrup position oftentimes is dictated by the shape of the tree. Um, the seat is dictated by the shape of the tree. When we see this build up in front here, um, that build up in front is there because the tree does that. Um, this one does not have the build up in the front the way this one does because he builds his trees differently than, than the other trees. Um, these are both very typical wade saddles. Um, while this one looks similar to a wade saddle, this one in form and function is actually much closer to the old California sta saddle than it is the wade saddle. Um, some people think that the Wade Saddle is a California design. It's actually not. Um, the Wade Saddle is actually a Mexican design originally. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the old Visalia saddle catalogs from the 1920s, 1930s, you see their Chihuahua Mexican saddle. Mm -hmm. And if you put a big horn on this and you took away this Cheyenne roll, it's exactly the same. I mean, it, in terms of function mm -hmm. um, and style, it's exactly the same. Um, but this one is closer to what people would consider like the Visalia 3B tree, mm -hmm. except that the, it's got the bigger post horn. Um, but in terms of function, this is much more like the old California style saddles. So when I take a look at the saddles, um, if you talk to 10 different saddle makers about saddle fit, you're probably gonna get about 15 different theories. <laughs> yeah. And when it comes right down to it, none of the theories really mean anything if your horse's back is sore. Um, as long as we're riding in balance, if their back is sore, then we need to take a real good second look at our saddles, mm -hmm. okay? Um, now, a couple of the theories in some of the sports saddles, and we'll just talk about this real quick and then throw these on. One of the theories goes so far as to say that they want what they call bridging, which means that they want the saddle having pressure here and here, and they want a space under it, so when the horse lifts his back, it fills that space. Um, good way to cripple a horse. It's a good way to get really sore backed horses. Um, their idea is that if the saddle has any curve to it, that when the horse lifts his back, that it's like you put a ball on top of a ball and then it's too much isolated pressure. But what happens instead is we get all the pressure here. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that theory about the ball on top of a ball doesn't really work anyway because when we watch this horse's background, we see that as it rounds, it doesn't really become a ball no, just okay? kind of, just where rises. our weight is. Just rises. It huh? rises from back here. Proper collection, the horse, the horse engages and the back should lift from the lower lumbar like a wave carrying the rider forward. It shouldn't lift from the center up anyway. And when we have proper collection, this does not round like a ball. So that whole theory is out the window anyway when we look at actual biomechanics. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to toss this saddle on and we're going to take a look at another, another theory that, um, that we see. And when I put a saddle on a horse, um, I, like to, I like to have it on without a, without a pad because it gives me a really good reference. One of the other theories that we see a lot, and I know I'm going to make some saddle makers mad, but oh well. Um, as long as the horses are happy, yeah. I'm happy. One of the other theories is they want to, they push down here and they push down here. Um, on the front the back and if it rocks they say no it doesn't fit huh? well those guys obviously haven't roped a lot and if they have I'd be really curious to see their horses backs because when you rope and you take the weight of that cow and that weight is either going out there forward and pulling here or the weights going out the back and pushing here if I don't have a little room for that to rock it's gonna be driving right in behind the shoulder or it's gonna be driving right into the loin. Mm. So if we have that 16 to 18 inches of weight bearing surface, which we have right here, and then we have a little bit of rock in the back and the front, then it's able to freely move on that horse's back and we're not gonna create that pressure. The other thing that it does 
is it also gives that horse room to bend under here. So when that horse bends like we saw earlier, there's room for his body to contract these muscles. All of this comes closer together and because we have the rock and the rock here, there's room for him to bend like that. If this doesn't rock, there's no room to bend. It's like putting a, just a board across his back. Mm -hmm. um, when we're also looking at these saddles, I wanna make sure that the back of this saddle, like you can see this one, the leather in the back very clearly goes up. This one does not. It, it is starting to a little bit, but that's just because of the pressure from being ridden. Mm -hmm. This one is coming up from the pressure from the horse's backs. This one was built that way, and so was that one. And that removes the pressure on the horse's back. If this comes flat out and this leather is sewn together, um, we saw that the first time I came here to Australia, mm -hmm. we had some saddles that the leather was sewn together, flat, and it might as well have been the tree. It might as well have been a piece of wood um, because it was creating some problems in those horses' backs. Um, I want to have that little bit of room under here. Okay? Um, when the horse does collect, again, we still have that good weight-bearing surface from here to here. Okay? So that's what I look for with my saddles. Um, now, depending on the saddle maker, um, this one is a Terrence McGowan saddle, and um, Terrence and I have been friends for quite a few years, and he has done a lot of experimentation with his saddle trees and studied a lot of the old saddles. But more importantly, Terrence has spent thousands and thousands of hours in the saddle because he made a big, most of his living for most of his life was made following cows. Um, he's ran his own ranches, he's helped other people with their ranches, um, so he has a lot of hours in the saddle. So he has both the, the equine biomechanical knowledge but also the practical application. Um, so there are only a few saddle makers that I personally use, um, but only because of, of the requirements I have. Doesn't mean that the other saddles are bad. This is this is a saddle that was made here in Australia by a guy that passed away, I don't know, yeah. a while ago. Hans Van Hees. Yeah. Um, and this is a very well-made saddle. Takes nothing away from the, the quality of this saddle. This saddle would probably fit two of my criteria. I could probably ride this all day and I could probably rope in this without having any problems. But I may not be able to get as much bend as what I would like to get in some of those high school movements um, that I can in this other saddle. So for me, the big thing with the saddle is number one, is always if the horse's back is healthy. Um, number two, what do I want to do? What are my goals? And is the saddle allowing me to do that without any restriction or is the saddle getting in the way? And then number three is style. Mm -hmm. So like my saddles have a smaller horn. It's, it's really, it's, it's more because it's tradition. It's what I grew mm -hmm. up with, the old mm -hmm. style, small California horn. This one's easier to actually dally on and learn on. Mm -hmm. um, that becomes style and style is last. And too much of the time what we see today in the modern world is style becomes first. And people think, well, so-and-so rides this saddle, so it must be cool. Uh, doesn't mean your th horse thinks it's cool. Mm -hmm. So number one is your horse. Is your horse's back healthy? And no matter what a saddle fitter, fitter tells you, if your horse's back is sore, you got to figure out what's going on. And as long as you're riding in balance, then it's not a problem. Having said that, if you ride out of balance, it doesn't matter how good the saddle fits, you're going to soar your horse's back. Yeah. Well, thanks. And you, you bet. see an awful lot of saddle fitting problems, don't we, when we're on a, on a yeah. travels around the world? That's something like with Steve and I teach in clinics, um, and I'm sure that he'll probably back this, this up in terms of experience. One of the biggest problems I run into doing clinics in terms of getting the horses to perform some of the stuff that we're looking at doing is bad fitting saddles. And pretty much every clinic I do, by the end of the clinic, especially like the three and four day clinics, we start finding those, those little problems where maybe the saddle didn't fit as good as we thought as we start to ride it more, do more bending, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, also really quickly, just a side note, um, the discussion about treeless saddles mm -hmm. comes up a lot, um, or flex tree saddles. And I'll just really quickly, the way I look at it personally, and everybody has to make their own decision on this, but I look at a treeless saddle the way I look at a backpack. If I put, if I put 50 pounds or 25 kilo in a backpack with no frame, yeah, I'm gonna be able to carry it for a little while. But if I put it in a backpack with a frame, I can carry it longer over more uneven ground, 
more athletically and more comfortably. That's kind of the way I look at the treeless saddles. Um, mm -hmm. The flex tree saddles, we've run into a lot of trouble lately with flex tree saddles. Um, one brand in particular that all of them have twisted to the, to the left because when the rider gets on on this side, the saddle twists, but the flex tree never flexes back. So you get these, this yeah. unevenness in flexing. If a, for a flex tree saddle to be truly effective, it's got to evenly flex and it's got to return. Um, for me personally, because I rope flex tree saddles are no good. That doesn't mean they're not good for somebody else, but you've got to be careful with what you're riding because any unevenness in that tree, right and left, is going to create problems for your horse. Yeah, I think as humans, we want to do the right thing by a horse. So exactly. it's easy to sell somebody something when you say, you know, it's, this yeah. is good for your horse. It's got no tree. Exactly. And they say, well, this saddle has a wood tree that's wrapped in rawhide, and that's got to be really hard on that horse's back. Well, having said that, what happens when you put a backpack on? Okay. This is more like an orthopedic backpack mm -hmm. as opposed to with a tree rather, or with a frame, as opposed to just a kid's backpack that you throw, you know, throw all that weight in and go try to hike up a hill. Yeah. Okay. Well, he's proof to me anyway. You know, yeah. I've ridden in all of them. That's the proof. I mean, really what it comes down to, it doesn't really matter what, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what any saddle maker says. What matters is what your horse says. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's a little annoying, you know. Paid a lot of money for that one. I like it, but I don't yeah. get the same results. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And that's when I first started riding Terrence's saddles. I could see a huge difference in the freedom of movement of my horses yeah. because of how he designs his trees, which is why... He has a big waiting list, a long waiting list, but it's totally worth it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Great. Cool. Thanks again. All right. Well, hope you enjoyed that. You can catch up with, uh, what's your website, Jeff? Um, it's, Cal it's, what is my website? I didn't know there was going to be a quiz. I didn't California study. California Bridal Horse. California Bridal Horse. It's down right now, but it will, um, we, we got hacked and got a virus, but it's in the process of being rebuilt. It'll be back up here pretty quick. Um, for the gear... Um, a couple sources when we're looking at gear, mm -hmm. California Gear is one website. Mm -hmm. McGowan Saddlery that made the saddle, he also mm -hmm. sells some. Um, I think there's some folks, if you send messages, there's some folks yeah. here in Australia that make yeah. some. Um, if you need any, just get in touch with Jeff on his website or yeah. get in touch with me at stevehalfpenny.com. And we can, and we'll help there's you out. a lot of different sources. Um, don't go to eBay. <laughs> no, no, I think yeah. we've made that clear on the yeah. first video. Yeah. If you didn't watch the first video, go back and watch it. Exactly. Cool. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the videos. Thanks, Jeff. Thank great. you.